So I want to give you guys a talk about a library that we use internally here called Incremental. And uh, only some of you have actually used Incremental. Uh, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what Incremental is and how it works and what problems it's trying to solve. Uh, but most of the talk is really going to focus on the long and winding road from the initial implementation of Incremental that we started with and the one that we've ended up with now. Uh, and it's sort of an interesting story because it's uh, lots of different concerns got mixed up there. Uh, there are the, the, the ideas behind the incremental come out of academic work on functional programming and algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff that came from those papers that we screwed up and that the academics got right in our initial versions. And there's a bunch of things that we got right that the academics didn't pay any attention to. Um, and kind of the sort of several year long history of this project is kind of an interesting back and forth uh, kind of between what you get from the kind of standard academic approach to looking at these problems and what you get when you're trying to use it for real work, uh, which is the experience that we have here. Okay, so let me say a little bit about what incremental is, what it's useful for. Um, and the basic goal of incremental is to allow you to build big, complicated computation, computations that depend on lots of data that are efficient, and are specifically efficient in the sense that when only small amounts of your input data change, you want to be able to kind of efficiently refresh that computation and get a clean version of the output out of the end of it. That's the, the kind of fundamental goal of incremental. And it's in many ways similar to what you would, to the computational model that you expect from a spreadsheet. Uh, we don't normally think of spreadsheets as programming languages, but they kind of are. Uh, they're different from the programming languages we're all used to. Uh, they're, it's interestingly kind of a functional programming language. After all, what do you put into a cell of a spreadsheet other than simple expressions that you know, are just a pure computation based on some other set of inputs? Uh, and the, 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 ver the, the spreadsheet world has kind of inverted what we think of from ordinary programming. In ordinary programming, code is king, right? That's what you look at. And then, ah, yeah, there's some data it operates on in the background, and you don't, that's not so visible. And in spreadsheets, it's the reverse. The data is the primary thing you see, and then the logic of the program is kind of hidden in those cells that are a little harder to look at. But separating from that part of it, the other interesting thing about spreadsheets is that they give you a way of expressing a computation that's structured as essentially a dependency graph. Every equation that's in a cell has some other set of inputs from which its value is derived. And Excel is very sensitive to this structure and tries to be efficient. So that if you have some really big, complicated spreadsheets, and we have really big and complicated spreadsheets at Jane Street, uh, Excel does a lot of work to update those efficiently. So if some of it changes, some of the cells are modified, then Excel only refires the part of the dependency graph that needs to be refired. And so this turns out to be a very effective programming paradigm, both because it's a nice way of building these efficient algorithms that, uh, without a lot of work to do so. And the other thing that's good about it is, is it also gives you a natural way to build visualizations of what's going on. One of the great things about spreadsheets is you can plug things, that you can sort of create a little monitoring sheet, which has references to various intermediate parts of your computations and displays them in one place. And this is kind of easy and natural and efficient to do because the intermediate parts of your computation are reified. They have a kind of explicit place in the world that you can refer to. And that makes all sorts of other things that you want to do later easier. And incremental is going to give us a version of that as well, but within the bounds of OCaml. Um, so I, what I, I guess what I want to start doing is start laying out in a little bit more detail what really precisely is the computational model that incremental gives you. And I'm going to do that by starting by bringing up the interface, the OCaml interface, that looks something like the, the interface of the first version of incremental that we built. Make that fit the screen. Um, so obviously, it's easier to understand this if you are comfortable looking at OCaml signatures. But I'm going to kind of go through piece by piece and try and unpack what the meaning of the different parts are. Uh, so uh, you can ignore the module type S at the beginning and end. That's just a kind of wrapper to give a name to the signature. Uh, but the, there's this main module, Inker. So that's the incremental itself. And it's a parameterized type. You can have an inker.t 
that contains within it an integer or a floating point value or a string or an array of strings or whatever kind of structure type you want can sit inside that tick A of the incremental. And then we have a bunch of basic operators that you can use for constructing new incrementals based on the incrementals you already have in your hand. So the simplest one is return. Um, so return does, in some sense, the minimal thing you could imagine doing, which is return takes an arbitrary value and gives you back an incremental computation that is always equal to that value. Like another natural name for this function is const. Right? It kind of returns the constant computation. Um, map is another interesting one. Map takes an incremental of some type A and a function from A to B and gives you a new incremental whose content is of type B. So I'm going to start drawing pictures on the wall. So you can imagine you start with something that has A's in it, and you call map, and it gives you a new one, which has B's in it. And there's some function f that takes you from A to B. And if you want to think about kind of what is like the living, breathing graph of this computation, we're going to start seeing those appear on the wall. So here, you imagine every time this A changes, it's going to cause this function f to refire to recompute the B. OK? So far, so good. All right, so this, this already gives us a little bit of expressive power. We can now start taking these, this map and start growing the computations by doing lots of maps at different points in the hierarchy. Uh, it's, it's worth noting, however, that there's something quite limiting about this. We can add new nodes and branch out, but we have no way yet of pulling back in. Right, so that's not the most exciting kind of computational graph. If for nothing else, like if you all start this with one thing and then this thing fires, like everything's going to change. It's kind of boring that way. Um, but we can, we can make it a little bit more interesting by adding uh, functions that bring things back together. So map2 is the first one. So what is the signature for map2 is a little harder to parse. Uh, but map2 takes two incrementals, an A incremental and a B incremental. And then a function that takes an A and a B and returns a C. And it gives you back a C incremental. Right? Pretty straightforward. And we can use that to start bringing things back together. Right? So we can make lots of interesting subcomputations, and then we can merge them together into something if we want. And in fact, once you have map 2, you effectively have map 3 and map 4 and map 5 by just combining multiple map 2s together. So you know, map gave us like a real new bit of expressivity, and map 2 gave us another one. Uh, and from there, there's a bunch of other things you can build on top of it. Uh, and the world that you're in now, when you just have these operators, is essentially the world where you can build more or less arbitrary static dependency graphs, right? Dis directed acyclic graphs. So you can add more nodes and keep on growing them and branch out and come back in, and you can build basically an arbitrary DAG. Uh, but the DAG is in some sense static. I mean, it's not totally static in the sense that here I can like call these functions and add new nodes, but it is static with respect to the input data. Right? So if I have this uh, input here and I change it, no matter what, it will never change uh, the structure of the dependency graph. And in fact, I can have multiple different inputs. Right? I can have lots of inputs that feed into this graph. And that doesn't really change anything. It's still static in the sense that we described before. But we can make it dynamic. And that's what the next operator does, bind. Uh, and bind is actually subtly different from map, and it's easy to not even notice the difference, but it turns out the difference really matters a lot. So the signature of bind is it takes an A incremental and a function that takes an A and returns a B incremental. And then it returns to you all in a new B incremental, right? So it's like the only difference between bind and map is the extra T that shows up right here. But otherwise, they are exactly the same. But that small one letter difference, it turns out, has a lot of expressive power. And the thing it's going to give us is dynamism, the ability to change the computations as we go. Um, so the way you can visualize a bind node, well, a bind node has a left-hand side and then a right-hand side. So the idea is the left-hand side of the bind node is the first input. Right, the thing that's, in some sense, the input to the bind. And then the right-hand side is going to be what's produced by this function here. So the, the idea is you, when you create a bind node, it has an input. Right, that's this left-hand side. Uh, and then depending on what this, what this is, it can pick any of a number of different nodes. 
to wire in as the right hand side. And it can change its mind as it goes because it can choose different incrementals depending on what the input is. And in fact, as we'll see, you can in fact even create new incrementals in that context. Um, so this is all a little abstract. Let me make this difference a little bit concrete, more concrete by looking at how you might implement if. So this is a tiny piece of code using the incremental interface I just showed you, which implements if in two different ways, once with map and once with bind. And as we'll see, even though they produce the same answer, they have different graphs and therefore different performance behaviors. Uh, so uh, this is kind of nonsense. This is just me implementing map three on top of map two. I told you I could do it before. That's actually the code to do it. We can, it's not super interesting, but it just makes the rest of this work. Um, and then my first implementation of map if, my first implementation of if is going to use map, uh, in particular this map three. So I'm going to call map three on a variable representing the condition, like the Boolean, true or false, the then clause and the else clause. And then what am I going to do with the condition the then and the else? I'm going to say if the condition is true, then return t, else return e. So one thing that's important but kind of subtle is, well, what's the type of c here? I can run Right, so bool incremental. And what's the type of C here or here? It's just a bool, that's right. So even though we're using, we're somewhat abusing the terminology here and we're using the same variables in different places, it's the kind of unwrapped version that we can then use for a straight up computation. And so the, the dependency graph here is actually really simple. All we do is we basically have a node with three inputs, the condition, the then, and the else. And anytime any of them changes, we recompute and we say, if it's true, return t, else return e. Right? And what's th the only part of this that's problematic is the performance behavior, which is to say, let's say this condition changes rarely. Um, and, if it, and let's say it's currently true. Then in some sense, once you know this, you know that you don't actually care about what's going on here. You don't really need to refire your if statement when this changes, only when this changes. But the map if implementation is not aware of that, so it recomputes it every single time when either branch changes, no matter what the condition is. So the bind implementation here has the other behavior. So for bind if, we bind on C, on the condition, and then if it's true, then we return T, otherwise we return E. But in this case, T and E are incrementals. Right? So what bind is doing in this case is choosing between two possibilities. So in the bind case, instead of having all three wired in, we have either the true case wired in, or we have the else case, the, either then or the else case wired in, but never both. Okay, so that, that maybe gives you a little bit more of a sense of, of the difference between map and bind. Do you have any questions about this? It's easy to get confused. It's like an interesting and quite different library. So. Okay, so the, I guess the other thing I want to say about bind is this use of bind in some ways undersells how important bind is because it makes it sound like just a small optimization about the firing structure of the resulting graph, but it's actually much, it's a much bigger deal than that because in addition to just changing if you, where you're pointing to amongst two existing incrementals, you can also do all sorts of new things. You can construct new incrementals by calling map and bind inside of the right-hand side of a bind. So for example, you could have some computation where you know, there's an infinite number of possible configurations, and you bind on some description of the configuration you want now, and the right-hand side constructs the computation for you. Like, for example, there might be some big sum product you want to do of a bunch of inputs. Which ones are they? Well, that might come in on the right-hand side of the bind, and then you construct the whole subgraph that does that computation for you. So bind really does a lot to add to the expressive power of the system, letting you do pretty general purpose dynamism in the middle of your incremental computation. Yeah, this is this is a good point. So, uh, and this is also this the whole structure of incremental is what's called a monad. It's a monadically structured library, and there's a standard trade-off between map and bind uh, in libraries like this, which is map is generally speaking simpler to use, simpler to understand, and simpler to implement, and bind is more powerful but worse in all the other ways. And that's true here. Bind it certainly adds a lot of complexity to the implementation of incremental. Um, as we'll see in a second, 
Uh, and it's also slower because it involves, in many cases, the allocation of new nodes and more heavyweight operations. So yeah, in, in, I mean, it's worth saying, these are all baby cases, and you can't really get a good understanding of why these things are useful by just looking at baby cases. So for example, here's one optimization to this. Don't do it incrementally at all. Like an if statement is a tiny amount of work, and incrementalizing it isn't all that valuable, and the difference between map and bind doesn't matter very much. So like in the very small, this is kind of in some sense all not very interesting. But when you get to bigger, more complicated things is where it matters. And you have to worry when you think about bind about exactly this problem of how expensive it is. And in fact, a lot of the uh, practical experience of using incremental is you sort of look at, you have to look at your program in two ways. One is what is the thing it's trying to do? And that's in some sense easy. You just kind of drop all the bind and maps, just forget about every incremental operation and see what it does as an all at once program. And that's its semantics, that's its meaning. But when you want to think about performance, you have to think about exactly where the incrementality lies, and you have to think quite hard about the difference between bind and map, because it makes a real difference. All right. So far, so good? All right. Uh, so let's, uh, so we talked about the basic interface a little bit. Uh, let me just kind of sort of remind and, and mention a few other points. So. As I said, the, the basic operations return map and map2. Those only let you build static DAGs. Bind gives you dynamism. Uh, an important part of this is uh, that we're really thinking about this as a way of optimizing a functional program, a functional program, something that's just computing and not doing side effects. And that makes everything easier to think about. Sometimes you want to do side effects in these, and one can talk about that. But I'm mostly going to ignore that for the purpose of this talk. One other thing that I didn't mention is this notion of cutoff. Um, which is if you have a big complicated graph, uh, a lot of the time you might want to stop the computation uh, earlier than you would imagine if you just like see what changed and then like fire the transitive closure, everything that is reachable from the thing you modified. Because sometimes even though something changed, uh, the, the output three stages down might not change. Right? Imagine, for example, you have some node that computes the max of two numbers. If the smaller number changed, well, going to stop right there. And you really want some notion of cutting off the computation when you detect that the input hasn't changed, or in some cases, hasn't changed by enough. If you're computing real valued things or floating point numbers, you might want to have some tolerance where you say, ah, eh, you know, less than 10 to the negative 15th, I don't care about differences that small. You might want to cut off the computation in some ways. So you really need support for cutoffs. And actually, one other thing, I forget, there's a couple other parts of the interface I didn't mention that are important. Um, so everything I've talked about, I, I kind of stopped at bind, right? So everything I talked about was about constructing these computations, you know, assuming that you have some incrementals to begin with. But I didn't tell you how to use the computation. I didn't tell you how to get incrementals to begin with. So let's talk about that. So stabilize is a somewhat uh, mysterious looking function. It takes unit and returns unit. What does it do? Uh, so what it actually does is it runs the whole computation. So the workflow with an incremental computation is you build the, the basic computation. Um, and you modify some of the inputs, and then you call stabilize to flush that through the graph, and then we get the outputs back out. So how do we get the outputs out? Well, we have this function value, which will take an incremental and spit back the value at you. Uh, and there's another function, which is very useful, called onUpdate, which registers a callback. It tells you when something has changed. And this goes back to the use case I was talking about before, where you might have some big computation where you want to put your finger in multiple spots so you can d display things from it, um, or otherwise, in other ways, react to it. And on update lets you kind of register your interest in some value and wait for it to come back to you. And now we have everything except we don't know how to put data into the system yet. Uh, and that's a variable. So that's the last piece of the interface. So he, a variable is, again, a parameterized type. You can create one with an initial value. You can set it, meaning you can change the value. And then you can call read. And what read does is it gives you back the incremental corresponding to that value. So you start building an incremental computation by creating a bunch of variables, reading off the incrementals from that, those variables, and then using the rest of the combinators that we have for building up the computation itself. All right. Any questions about this interface? If you don't understand this interface, you're hosed for the rest of the talk. So we should. Do you end up with cycles, or is there something? Ah, yes. So the, the rough story is this. If you, if you do everything in a beautiful functional style, which we often don't, then you're basically guaranteed to not have cycles. Uh, 
if you do some clever things to optimize, like you try and like memoize computations that you do a lot uh, so that you don't have to rebuild them, then it's easy to come up with cycles, and you have to figure out what to do about that. That's actually a serious issue. And we'll talk about how it deals with cycles is interesting and different between different implementations that we went through. OK? All right, let's get back to my high quality slides. Uh, so I'm going to go through a bunch of different versions, some in more, some in less depth. I'm probably going to talk about this one in the most depth because it's the easiest to understand. This is the first version that we did that's, that uh, Stephen Weeks uh, and Milan Stanojevich wrote uh, when years ago, at this point, we decided we wanted a version of this. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is what is the stabilization function? Because that's kind of the key thing that we have. It's the way in which you propagate all the information. So this computation graph I've been describing and drawing on the board, you more or less make that real in OCaml you know, objects, which you, know, you allocate them and they have pointers to each other in a way that roughly reflects the structure of this dependency graph. Um, one important thing to understand about it is you have to have pointers going from the variables up. Right? When you represent a graph like this, it's not obvious which direction you need the pointers. But if you think about the, the performance characteristics you want out of this, for the work that we're doing, we want to be able to go up. Why is that? Because the new information comes in at the leaves, and you want to do the minimal amount of work that you have to do based on which of the leaves have changed. So the basic structure of how any algorithm to do this kind of has to work is some of your leaves are dirty because they've been set. You go through and do the propagation starting from there and stop when you don't need to go any further. Uh, and so that requires that from the leaves you know where they connect to. So you need these upward pointers. Um, so the, the algorithm is trickier than you might imagine if you haven't thought about it at all because, uh, because of what happens when you have, as you often do, recombinant graphs, meaning the graph fans out and then comes back in. Right, so let's draw a simple example of a recombinant graph. So you have to think a little bit hard about how you're going to fire this structure. Because let's say we just do a simple depth first search. Right? We go through and say, oh, this has changed. So this has to be recomputed. So this has to be recomputed. So that has to be recomputed. OK, we're done with that. OK, so since this changed, this also has to be recomputed. So oh, wait, now we have to recompute this one twice. Right? So you think, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad. You have to do something twice. How big of a deal is that? But once you get twice, you basically have exponential badness. Because you can take examples like this and kind of stack them on top of each other. And at each level of the stack, like you know, one update becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16. So you get a kind of exponential blow up of unnecessary work if you just do a completely naive walk of the tree. And you might think, oh, maybe I should do breadth first search. So I get to this thing at the same time. But I mean. I tricked you already, because look, I made two links here and only one here. So now you won't reach it at the same time. So you need actually something more principled than just like changing the order of the search. So what's the solution here? The solution is to do it in two passes. Pass one is you figure out what needs to be recomputed. You basically walk through the graph. And imagine like there might be other parts of this computation that, that don't depend on this node and don't need to be refired. Right? In fact, you can right, sort of think about this world here. Like, this and all of this needs to be redone, but none of these nodes do. So one thing you can do is just do a first pass where you mark, all, you mark the whole transitive closure of this node as dirty. And then when you're done, you then do the actual propagation of the firing. But the key trick here is when you mark nodes as dirty, you also let them know how many of their inputs are dirty. And then they don't recompute until the number of dirty inputs they have drops to zero. Right? So here, if you do the same tr uh, thing we did before, we'd walk up here, and then we'd kind of tell this guy that th one of his inputs was clean. But it wouldn't fire yet, because it knows it has one more. It has to still wait. And then we go back and start going this way. And then finally, when we get here, then this guy knows he needs to fire. And then he recomputes and causes the next level up to recompute. Okay, So that's the sort of basic algorithm. It's very simple. Uh, it's quite fast. It's easy to understand. Everything's great. Or, well, not everything is great, it turns out. Uh, so the first problem we have has to do with garbage collection. And it turns out lots of pretty functional 
programming abstractions that are built are built on top of horrible, imperative, complicated, messy underneath that are hard to understand. And one of the big reasons they're hard to understand is how they interact with the garbage collector. Uh, so the particular problem here is, has to do with the direction of the pointers. So we have pointers up from the leaves, which means as long as the leaves are alive, everything they point to will remain alive. Um, and you might think, well, OK, that seems like a reasonable property. But you don't want to keep things alive because they're connected to inputs. You want to keep these alive because someone is paying attention to them on the output side. And in particular, if you have in the middle of this graph something dynamic, where there's a bind node that is allocating new nodes and, like forget and dropping references to nodes that it created previously, well, those nodes it created previously are still hooked in up from the leaves. So if you don't do anything clever at all, they're never actually ever going to get collected. So you have to do something to take things that, have been, that are no longer observable in this system and drop all the, all the pointers to them from the inputs, which have to remain alive because you know, somebody is feeding data in from the outside into those things. So those are going to be kept alive. Um, so we need some way of figuring out what's going on. And the, and the way we do this is by maintaining reference counts from externally held nodes. Right? So we're going to keep track of whenever someone has a node that they hold to on the outside. We'll do a reference count of the number of times you are referenced from some externally held node. And if that reference count drops to 0, then we're going to cause you to drop any, to cut yourself off from the graph so you can be collected. OK? So that's relatively simple. The only issue is, how do you keep track of whether you have external references, right? Because after all, none of this stuff is ever going to get collected, so the garbage collector isn't going to tell you anything. So how do you figure it out? So it's pretty easy. The basic idea is instead of handing back these actual nodes that are in the internal graph back to outside users, you create an extra little node for each one of these called a sentinel. And the sentinel has, is just an extra cell that points to the real thing and isn't pointed to by anything else in the graph. Um, and what you do is you attach to every sentinel what's called a finalizer. And a finalizer is just a hook in the garbage collector that right before it collects an object, it warns you and says, oh, this thing's about to be ripped out. And you use the finalization of the sentinels as the way to trigger the removal of the reference counts. Basically, the things that you're counting references from is the sentinels. And so it's their arrival and removal that causes you to update the reference counts. OK. So far, so good. Does that make sense? All right. So everything's great. It's a wonderful implementation. There are no problems. Um, right. I told you about the sentinels already. Uh, so there's one small problem with this uh, design I told you, which is I talked before about how important being able to cut off the computation is. And it's impossible here. So that's awkward. Uh, so why is it impossible? Because I have this two-pass algorithm. Like the first pass marks what needs to be recomputed, and the second pass recomputes it. And never did I say some way of figuring out whether you needed to be recomputed. The, the first pass where you mark what needs to be recomputed is totally naive, right? You can't look at the values because they haven't been computed yet. So you just mark everything that's in the transitive closure as needing a recomputation. So if you have things that are important to cut off, there's just no story here for how that's going to work. Uh, so we came up with a story, which is a little bit of an awkward story. We said, well. Probably, like when you create a, a node that's explicitly meant to be a cutoff node, we can probably make the assumption that almost always it cuts off, right? That's why we did. And then, and then if we do that, well, what we can do is like this. Well, we're going to run this algorithm to its completion under the assumption that all cutoffs don't propagate. But we're going to keep a list of the cutoffs that refired, and at the end we'll check. And if any cutoff node changed by enough that the cutoff function says it really should refire, then we just kind of restart the algorithm again from there with a round of cutoff nodes. So this sounds like it'll work, and it does work, but it's also bad. Because if you have complicated nested cutoffs in your system, well, you can refire exponentially often. Right? It has the same problem we had before of the double fire. So we need to be, to, to our credit, like we knew from the beginning that this was bad. And so we just use cutoffs in limited cases kind of at the edge of computations. And more complicated internal stuff, we said, well, we're just going to live without cutoffs. Um, so that was a big problem that the system had. Uh, it has another quite significant problem that took us longer to figure out. And this has to do with our naive idea about how the garbage collection of unnecessary bits of the graph is going to work. 
So remember, we talked about like bind nodes can allocate new things, and the old things are now no longer referred to, but are still hanging around and connected to the inputs until the garbage collector collects their sentinels so we can update the reference counts and figure out that the things can be removed. Right? So this sounds reasonable, but relying on the garbage collector to collect something but well, you, you shouldn't really rely on it to collect it especially soon, right? The garbage collector collects things when it thinks it's running out of memory. It could be really a long time before it wants to collect it. And in the meantime, the thing that wasn't obvious to us at first is these nodes that are hanging around are still, like, they're still alive. They're still kicking. It's not just there's extra memory. They're hooked into the inputs. They're still computing. They're running. Every time inputs fire, they're still firing. So that seems a little bad until you think about it more and realize it's horrifically bad. Because if you have nested sets of binds, this is happening over and over and over again. And like at each level, you're like splitting yourself and splitting yourself and splitting yourself. So you're actually generating exponential amounts of garbage in the, the system. And you're like, you kind of, you sort of start with that, ah, and then it'll eventually be collected. But it turns out between now and eventually, it's going to allocate exponential amounts of stuff that you don't need. So this is, in some sense, an obvious disaster in retrospect. We didn't notice it at first, because our very first applications for this did not use lots of nested binds. But when we started building user interfaces uh, with this, it turned out nested binds were really useful. And we sort of noticed these weird, very long pauses in the middle and didn't know why. And it turned out to be due to this. All right. Any questions? Lots of, lots of exciting, confusing stuff going on. So you should feel free to not understand things. Yes? Uh, how well does it correlate to what it was in the paper? I mean, how close was this? We'll get there. This implementation is quite different from the one in the paper. And indeed, when I gave the talk at CMU, like the guys who were responsible for the original paper like looked a little horrified. I was like, no, it's the whole point of the talk. It gets better, I promise. It really, it really does get better. Uh, but the results were this was pretty fast. We know the cutoff behavior is terrifying, and we know things aren't collected eagerly enough. But when used sort of within a scope where, where the kind of available sem semantics was good enough, it was a really effective piece of software. And we actually were able to build systems that were very hard to build without it. And it was all pretty efficient. We were all very excited about it, even though there were all these problems that we knew about. So we knew, however, there was a problem. So our first attempt to fix it, we knew about the cutoff problem, but didn't like totally understand this other problem about too much allocation. And our first attempt to fix this problem was to go back, in some sense, and read the papers more carefully uh, and understand what they did about this. Uh, and it turned out they had a solution to this. And the solution involves time. Uh, so the basic idea is that you want to have a topological sort of the graph when you're going through and doing the firing. Because then there's a simple algorithm for making sure that everything is fired only once that can be done in a way that's sensitive to cutoffs, because as you're going, you can do the full computation, so you really know the values in your hand. And what you do, so just to be clear, a topological sort is a, set of, it's a, it's a labeling of the graph with identifiers that are, that are sortable, so you get to have a total order of everything in the graph, such that this ordering respects the dependency order, which means you never go forward in the ordering and end up crossing a back edge. You're always kind of walking forward when you're walking forward in numbers. So the way you do propagation, once you have a top sort, is really easy. You have a heap of things that need to be recomputed but haven't been yet. You start with your dirty nodes. You throw them on the heap. And then you start taking things out and propagating and throwing all the things that get fired onto the heap. And because you're always pulling it out in the right order, you'll never visit a node until you've recomputed everything that that node depends on. Right? So it sort of guarantees to you that you never refire everything. Um, but you can at any point like, look at a recomputed node and say, eh, this didn't change by enough. I want to stop here. And that doesn't disturb any of the invariants that you have. So top sorts are good. They make this kind of graph algorithm simpler. The only problem is, how do you get a top sort? So the, here's a really, there's, there's a bunch of ways of approaching this, but here's a really kind of very naive, simple way of thinking about a topological sort, which is one way we can do it is we can solve it using a clock. Right? So every time we allocate a new node, we'll look at the clock on the wall and say, what time is it? And we'll put that timestamp on the node. And now there's, there's an, an ordering. And as long as we're only using the map and map2 and map3 part of incremental, it turns out everything works because every new node only depends on old nodes. So the time order respects the dependency order. So we're happy. Um, so where does it fall apart? It falls apart when your graphs are dynamic. Right? If you're just kind of constructing the graph in one early sweep, 
the timestamp is enough. And in fact, you don't need a clock, right? You just use a counter that you upgrade every time. But so, so that, all, that all works. But when you're in the middle reallocating nodes in the middle of your graph, it's not so hot anymore. So it's the problem is when you're allocating nodes inside of a bind. That's when you're in trouble. So the idea is to use a different kind of timestamp, right? a kind of logical time that will solve our problems. And the idea is that instead of picking, you can think of the old way of using a clock is you look at the set of all of the timestamps that have been already used, and you, you find a new timestamp that's bigger than all of those. So the alternate rule is to say, I'm going to get a new timestamp in a different way. I'm going to pick a timestamp that's bigger that that's bigger than everything that is smaller than the bind under which I was allocated. Right? So if you were a new guy allocated inside some bind, right, you always want to be behind that bind. So you want to be an, a, a, a timestamp that's before that bind and after everything else that's before that bind. Right? That's basically the rule. And in some sense, if you have that rule, if you can, if you can allocate timestamps that way, everything almost just works. The only issue is how do you allocate timestamps that way? So because you know you have to, if you had like a bind node that's here in the order, and then there's some other stuff behind it, well, you can allocate something in the middle here, and then maybe you're going to need to do something in the middle here, and like these are all going to get really really close together as you allocate more and more of them. So you might think like, what data structure do I use for these? Maybe I could represent them as real numbers or something, but though that's not so hot, right? They're like you know unbounded in length, and the whole thing's kind of a disaster. Um, so it turns out there's a bunch of clever data structures for doing this that have good asymptotic behavior. Uh, the simplest thing that we thought about, which I think which, which works reasonably well, is to just use count, have your counters kind of allocated in some big space, like it's an integer space. And like when you pick ones, like pick you know, ones that are kind of well spaced out to begin with. <laughs> and then when you have to go in between, well, you go in between. And when you run out of space, you just flatten stuff out. It's almost like a garbage collection step. You sort of wait until you have no space, and then you just like redistribute. So you decompact. Yeah, you just decompact. It's the opposite of a garbage collector. It's a negative garbage collector or something. I don't know. You, you, but it has the same flavor of like you're building up a problem, and you wait till it gets pretty big, and then you like have a batch operation that clears it out. And there are other approaches of doing this too, with like clever binary trees and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You could use trees for it. It all it all depends on exactly the performance. Uh, properties you want. The nice thing about the the kind of smooth out one is it's really simple to implement, and the identifiers themselves are really cheap to compare. And you do a lot more comparison than you do allocation, so there's a big win there for using the ints. But anyway, there's lots of different tricks, but like that's the basic idea. Um, and so we went ahead and implemented this, and it was pretty easy. We were able to like an, an intern who didn't have a ton of experience was able to kind of go in and and create a version of this, and it worked better and worse. So it was better in that like, the semantics made more sense, but it was worse in that the performance was worse. It was a lot worse, like you know, one and a half to four times worse than the original implementation. So, OK, so we weren't super excited about that. Uh, and that kind of just stayed as an intern project, and we did not roll it into production. Uh, and then we got to version 3. So version 3 is to solve the other problem that we have. And this is the version that we actually used for a long time for our, the big GUI apps that use this. Sorry, you had a question, Eric? Sorry, because I used version 3 for a while, but I used version 2. Um, yeah, they're numbered in different ways. This is, uh, in this talk, I call this one version 3, and I think this is the right time order of the versions. Um, anyway, so this version is the one that's trying to just solve the exponential garbage problem. And this is just the problem I talked about before, which is it takes a long time to collect everything, and those things that keep on running because they're still connected to the, to the variables, are allocating lots of garbage. So bind infested code gets totally screwed by, the, by, this, by our original implementation. So this is trying to fix it. Um, and the idea, the basic idea is actually relatively simple. Uh, sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I'm curious. If you allocate, I don't understand. These two things seem to like help one another in a certain sense. Um, if you allocate a lot, then the finalizer, then you would collect garbage more quickly, I would think. So that's true, but isn't really good enough, right? The point being, like, it's still exponential, right? There's, it, can, it, it can be going so fast that you have trouble keeping up with it. Um, so, uh, you know, you can argue about lots of things, but anytime you have an actual part of your algorithm which is exponential, like, it's very easy to trip off into it not working at all. Um, 
So we had a fairly simple approach, which is we're going to keep explicit track of uh, what is the observed part of the graph. Uh, and we do this by minting explicit values called observers. And so just like we, the things that were kept alive are kind of the transitive closure of the variables, the things that are needed is the transitive closure of the, of the observers in the opposite direction. Um, and we eagerly keep track of observation changes. So when a bind node causes one node to, instead of looking at one incremental, looking at another, the one it stopped looking about immediately moves into being unobserved, and the new one immediately moves into being observed. So when you have a bind fire and it changes its focus from one area to another, you have this guarantee that only, only the sort of current reason, real bit of the computation is actually observed. And you have an extra invariant that you make sure that only the observed part of the computation actually churns. You quiesce the unobserved part. You tell it not to compute anymore. And that is basically enough to solve the problem. Because the problem wasn't that we had these things that were around for a little while. It's that they were still alive and kicking while they were around. So we kind of, you know, early kill them a little bit early before the garbage collector actually gets to them to stop them from causing trouble. Um, so let's actually look for a second at what the interface looks like with observers. So now we have, uh, we have uh, three different components of the interface instead of just two. There's the incremental, which is kind of like it was before, except we've removed the part that lets you observe values from it. There's the variables, which are exactly the same. And now there's this new thing called an observer, which you can create from an incremental. You can extract values from. You can register on update functions for. And importantly, you can stop observing them. Right? So this is like the new hook. And you see, like, they're, in some sense, they're the dual of the variable. They're kind of the opposite of the variable. They keep track of opposite parts of the graph. And the variable is something that you create from nothing and then convert to an incremental. And the observer is something you can create from an incremental and then peel information out of. OK, and this, this part of the interface really does is preserved to the modern version of incremental. It's essentially a reference count. Does this mean that you have to explicitly uh, stop observing things? Okay. It does. Well, sort of. As we'll see, when an observer is garbage collected, it is automatically unobserved. But just remember how I said before, it's not a good idea maybe to let the garbage collector quiesce things that aren't needed anymore. So in practice, you should unobserve things when you don't need them anymore. Which is not to say that it always happens. Uh, okay, so this worked great. We used it a lot. We used it in a bunch of our internal UIs, um, and it mostly worked. Although we recently replaced it, and we're very happy with that replacement. Um, okay, so now we're on to version four. Version four was like really going back and reading the Akar paper carefully. Umu Takar is like the main guy behind the original papers in this area. Uh, so this was not, not an, like, a useful implementation exactly, but it was uh, a good learning experience. Uh, we kind of went back and integrated the, the, v, the, uh, uh, the V2 and V3 things into one implementations. We learned a few extra invariants from the papers that we needed about thinking about what depends on what. Um, we also learned some interesting things about the way in which the original implementation worked. And one of the interesting things that struck us is that uh, the original implementation from a car did not distinguish how map nodes and bind nodes were constructed. Um, in other words, you can implement map in terms of bind, because bind is a more powerful operator. But that turns out to be crushingly expensive, because it involves lots of extra allocation, because you end up kind of allocating new nodes all the time when the graph is actually static, and so you don't really need to do allocation. Um, so a lot of, there were lots of, I think, practical performance problems in those original implementations that turned out not to be necessary and that we didn't have in ours because we specialized the map, map and map n implementation to be more efficient. Um, so v5 was like a more practical attempt to sort of combine v2 and v3. Uh, it also added one extra bit of functionality, which was interesting, which was, uh, remember how I said, I described this nice thing with timestamps 
how we're going to implement, insert new timestamps before the bind and after everything else, and that's going to make things work out okay. So it turns out if you're like a good functional programmer and you only use good functional programming primitives, everything works great. Uh, but if you aren't, and you really shouldn't be, right? It doesn't work out so well. In particular, a thing that you very naturally want to do in this kind of context is uh, memoize computations. If there's some subgraph that you computed and then some other part of your computation wants to do it, you really want to share the same one. Right? It's, it's kind of a form of common sub-expression elimination applied to your computation, meaning there's some common sub-piece, and you want to actually share the computation from that sub-piece rather than repeating it. So the way you implement that is you generally have like some table somewhere which keeps track of previous constructions of graphs so you can remember them and get them back when you want them again. But this can cause you to pull things out of order, right? not in the order that was originally intended by this kind of timestamp system. And so the end result is you can, even when you're doing what is sensible incremental code, you can construct back edges. And you asked about cycles before. What happens when you introduce a cycle with a back edge? Well, for the implementations up till here, uh, what happened is you just, well, in the original implementation, you just had an infinite loop. So like the way your, your program told you that you had introduced a back edge is you said stabilize and it never ended. You know, I mean, fail stop, right? It's at, least, at least it doesn't like send orders or something terrible. Uh, but that's not obviously not ideal. Uh, in the simple like a car style timestamp thing, it's just going to say kaboom. Like you've put in an ill-founded edge, I'm going to throw an exception and you're dead. And it turned out in real programs there were lots of these backwards edges, so that was not so hot. So we added to this version a sometimes used dynamic top sort algorithm. We would like normally allocate these counters in the ordinary way, but if it saw a back edge rather than blowing up, it would say, well, I don't know how to do like a really good incremental top sort algorithm, but I can just like redo the top sort in this case. Um, so it's a little hacky. You sort of might worry that maybe there are bad corner cases here, but it kind of worked. Um, so this was like semantically much better, uh, but, but the performance was bad. Uh, and why was the performance bad? Well, remember I said there's a heap, and you put the things in the heap, and you take them out. Well, heaps are kind of expensive data structures, right? The constant isn't all that low, and they're you know, log n to remove an element. So it costs a fair amount to flow things through a heap. And even after we, you know, we no longer had like the thing an intern did in a few months, we had like, uh, you know, a brand new implementation that a bunch of good people had worked on for a long time to try and make work well, but it still didn't work fast enough to make us comfortable about replacing it. All right, so v6 uh, was to eliminate the heap from the system. So the core idea is to, say, is to move a little bit away from the notion of using a total order. Uh, and the key observation is we actually never needed the total order. You don't, all you need, a top sort totally orders all the nodes, but it's enough to have a partial order, right? Which, what is a partial order? It just means not every, there are lots of things that are different that are marked as equal in a partial order or not, not comparable to each other. You know that some, well, some things are really different and some things you can't tell. Uh, and it turns out that's okay as long as the partial order reflects the dependency uh, structure well. And that, it's actually pretty easy to think of partial orders that do that. Uh, so one example is the height of a node in the graph. So how do we define the height? You can simply define it recursively as, if you're a leaf, it's zero. And otherwise, it is the maximal height of all of your children plus one. Right, look at all your kids, see what the max height is. You're, you're one taller than that. And this also has the nice property that it respects the dependency order. And by virtue of being a partial order, we get to have something with a very small number of valences, a small number of distinct values. Right? So you could imagine you could have a graph with hundreds of thousands of nodes, but only 70 different heights. Right? So now, instead of having to have a heap that might have 100,000 nodes in it, you could just have an array of lists. Right? You can have a very simple, constant time, low overhead data structure for keeping track of the things that need to be fired. Because the valence is, is like small enough, you can stick it in your pocket. Right? You can just have like a little array that just takes care of it. Um, and this turned out to be a good, a good idea. And this idea was what we called a pseudo height. So I said the height of a node is 1 plus the max of the height of the children. A pseudo height is just like that, uh, except it's not quite so painful to, to compute. 
So why is the height bad to compute? The height's bad to compute because imagine you have like a big graph, and at the bottom of the graph, there's a node with a bind where it sometimes is height 2 and sometimes it's height 1. If that flips back and forth, you have to renumber everything back and forth. So like you're suddenly taking uh, a thing that should be constant and making it time linear in the overall size of the graph. So that's kind of a disaster. Um, so the pseudo height is almost like a height, except it it's memory sensitive, which is to say it never goes down. So your height, your pseudo height is the maximum your pseudo height has ever been, basically. So it starts out being the height and it's, it's never willing to come down. And that, in practice, has worked really well. It also has some weird corners. You can write some terrible data structures that kind of terrible incremental computations, but basically like, have two nodes that kind of change their mind as to who is ahead of who, and they keep on walking each other up the height graph. Uh, um, but you kind of never see it. So this is not a thing we warn people about, especially. Uh, and you can construct it if you want. Like you could, if you go back into your desk, you probably think about how to do this. But it doesn't seem to come up in real programs. Uh, and we'd know because like, we get, we'd get errors. Uh, when we exceed the pre-committed height. Um, so this turns out to work really well in practice. Uh, and, 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 this, and this is, again, a property that our current system has. So what, what are our results? So the performance was now quite good. Like, if you think about the overall performance story, so here's sort of the picture. So imagine, like, up is, is bad. It's taking longer. So we started off with something pretty good. And then we got something with better semantics, but you know, worse behavior. And you know, a little better, a little worse, kind of hovering around here for several versions. And then finally, with this version, we could kind of, you know, if this was our baseline, we finally kind of brought it down to, like, yeah, maybe just a little bit worse than v1. Right? So now we had like, the good behavior. And the performance was about as good as before. So we were relatively happy with this. Um, uh, so we had another nice trick which we wanted, which was, so this is in v7, and we had kept this, uh, this structure of having finalizers on all of the versions, but it turns out we didn't really need finalizers everywhere. The finalizers were there, remember, for the sentinels, and the sentinels were there for the ref counts of figuring out when you disconnected things so that they could be collected because they were no longer seeable anywhere. Um, so it, it, we realized that we could basically just use the observers for this with a little bit of extra hackery. In particular, we still need to make sure things are collectible when they're totally unreachable. Um, but we can do it in a somewhat subtler and cheaper way, which is we just use the observability data to enforce the invariant that there are no pointers from the observed to the unobserved world. So if you see like a connection from the observed to the unobserved world, which you can check every time your observability changes, you say, well, I'm not allowed to have that pointer, so I cut it off. And if it changes in such a way that you need to reestablish the pointer, well, then you can reestablish it. Um, and it helps that you kind of are on the, you have to be on the right side to reestablish it, but, but the, that's, that is in fact the case. Because the guy who, who becomes observed kind of knows who he depends on, and he tells that guy to reestablish the upward pointer. Uh, and this now means that the unobserved world uh, is kind of free floating. It's no longer connected to the variables. So if no one is con is no one is using it, then it can actually be collected. So we basically got to get rid of you, you know. It used to be if you had 300,000 nodes in your graph, you had 300,000 finalizers, and no more. Right now, you only need. You might have you know a big 300,000 node graph where you have 10 output values, and then you only need 10 finalizers. And finalizers cost something from uh, the from the collector. So there's real value there. Um, again, also in this version, we discovered uh, some new semantic constraints that we hadn't realized having to do, again, with bind nodes. Bind nodes are really the complicated bit. Uh, and the thing we realized in this version is that when a bind node fires and you, you create nodes, and then it fires again and you create new nodes, those old nodes are kind of bad. It turns out it's not safe to depend on them. So you have to make sure to kind of obsolete, to kill off nodes and not allow dependencies on those. So that was uh, a new thing we discovered in this version. Um, but, again, but the real big win for this version was the finalizers. Uh, and it was great. Now it was finally like we'd gotten down to here. So that was pretty good. We were excited. Um, and we thought we were done. And then uh, the, uh, the, the guys who were working on this, uh, Valentin Gatien Baron and Nick Chapman, who were the main guys who were doing this, all these kind of different versions of incremental after the first few were, were done by these guys. And so they kind of handed it back to Stephen Weeks for code review. Um, and if you've ever met Stephen, Calling it code review, it's like it's more like code rewriting, uh, <laughs> right? Because he, he wants to make it look like he wants to. And, and between 
So V7 was sort of the, the kind of final version of this process, but then it turns out we ended up with a V8. So why did we end up with a V8? Well, between the time that we were working on like all these versions and the time we did the final review, we had learned new things about how allocation, how much allocation costs for these kinds of programs. Uh, and we'd gotten some new features in the language. In particular, we got what are called generalized algebraic data types. Uh, and, we, and this gives you nice ways of encoding what one calls existentials. So let me talk a little bit about this if it sounds like weird and philosophical, it almost is. Uh, but the, the idea is basically uh, this, that the, the way, the way in incremental is initially implemented is kind of tricky in that you have all these different nodes. Remember, there's like a parameter for these nodes, right? Something might be computing an int, and something else might be com computing a list of strings, right? Different kinds of things in different parts, but they all have to sit in one data structure. And as you know, in OCaml, a, you know, an OCaml list is parameterized in its genericity, right? It's an alpha list. It might have integers or strings, but it can't have like a mixture of things. And we kind of need to have a mixture of things. We need to be able to generally plug these guys in. So the way you do that is you create what you might call a poor man's object. You have a little record, and each record has a bunch of values that are functions that let you do things to the underlying object, but don't expose the type of that object. And instead of directly storing the underlying object, it's this record full of closures that you actually keep in your data structure. So this turns out to totally suck. And it sucks for two distinct reasons. One reason it sucks is it's slow. Like closures are relatively, they're relatively cheap, but if you allocate a bunch of them, it can cost a lot in terms of memory. But it's also bad as a programming experience. It's like programming with oven mitts, right? You have to like mint one unique oven mitt for every operation that you want to do. And like you kind of go in every time and do the exact thing you can do. But like you can't see what's happening on underneath. The usual programming style we're used to in OCaml where you have like, you know, these variants and records and nested structures that tell you exactly what's going on so you can really operate directly on it just aren't there when you work in this, in this kind of object-oriented almost style. And the thing that lets you do what you want is a slightly richer thing in the type system. So existentials basically let you talk about a thing whose type you don't know uh, more naturally in terms of the operations that you have on top of it, uh, saying like, yeah, I don't know what the type is, but there exists a type that it is, and I can operate on it. So that helps, and, and generalized algebraic data types give you a little bit more expressiveness so you can sort of do a little more in just kind of writing these things down as ordinary, vari as ordinary you know, listed different possibilities. So it was a win in two ways. It was a performance win because we got rid of all these closures that we don't really need. And it was also a comprehensibility win. The code was much easier to understand. And because of that, it was a performance win again, because it turned out there were optimizations that you could do because you could see what you was going on underneath. You knew the exact structure and names of the kinds of nodes you had. So there were cases where you could do small optimizations and rewirings of the graph because you knew what was going on. And so it had a bunch of different wins. Um, so what was the, the result of this was like the performance did this. Right? Like it was suddenly massively better. It was shocking. It was so much faster that end user applications, like serious, relatively well-tuned end, end user applications, were three times faster after this change than before. Right? I don't mean the library was three times faster. I don't know what the multiplier on the library itself is. But the actual applications got three times faster. And the thing that this teaches you is that these applications that you made faster by adding incremental are in some sense now totally bounded by incremental. Right? There's almost nothing left. So, so if you think about it, you have a computation that's too slow to do all at once. So you make it much faster by incrementalizing it. But now, almost all the actual comp computing you're doing is the, is the incrementalization framework itself rather than the real computation. So the returns to improving the incrementalization framework are really high. And that's kind of what we saw when we actually rolled this out. It was a really massive difference. And in fact, the thing that happened recently is one of the kind of trading system front ends that used incremental was, was very slow. And it was using v3 from this talk. And it had been for a long time. We were nudging about getting it fixed. And ah, we got a lot of things to do. It was busy. And finally, we're like, OK, OK, we'll do it. And we moved it from v3 to v8 to the current production version. And it was astonishing. Like, it was so much faster. Like, people say, this went from, like, the thing that ruins my life to the fastest application I interact with. Um, so that was an, an interesting and kind of gratifying thing to see happen. Um,
All right, so that was a big deal. Uh, so let's talk about like what there is left. So now we have this, this library, we use it a lot. Uh, we use it for both things that are kind of compute engines and also for user interfaces. Uh, and in starting to think about using it even more for user interfaces. Um, so a, a few different things that we've thought about as potential future improvements and some that are in flight. Uh, so one observation that we've made recently in thinking about using incremental as part of doing JavaScript applications, of all things, because uh, it turns out you can compile OCaml to JavaScript and run it in a web browser, uh, is that you could use incremental to incrementalize the computation of what you need to show to the user. Um, and this is a thing that we've thought about doing kind of in a way that's kind of consistent with this kind of virtual DOM approach that's become increasingly popular with libraries like React, uh, which is just a kind of straight up JavaScript library that uses this approach. And the nice thing about virtual DOM is it's a way of thinking about your computation of what people see as just a simple function from data to the thing that's viewed. Um, and it turns out optimizing simple functions is exactly what incremental is good for. And so we've thought about using it in this context. And one of the things that we've discovered was kind of missing in incremental the way we started with, with it is incremental is really good if you have, like if you have your inputs and like, boom, they're smashed into a million pebbles. And now you're kind of, you know, each one being an incremental. And now you're kind of building up from those pebbles the computation. It works really well. But if you start with just like a big data structure, like a big functional data structure that kind of, you know, a new version lands and a new version lands and a new version lands. It's not clear how to bootstrap that into incremental in a clean way. Um, and one of the things we're playing around with is using, uh, adding some extra primitives to incremental that allow us to kind of take an ordinary functional data structure that is changing as an incremental value and kind of efficiently extract information about individual subcomponents by taking advantage of the fact that a lot of these functional data structures can be diffed efficiently. So this uses, like, for a big and important part of this is the function, there's the map data structure, which has this function symmetric diff that lets you really efficiently rediscover what changes have been made between two maps, kind of taking advantage of being able to cut off that computation on physical equality of the new map and the old map. Um, so that turns out to be a kind of productive and interesting little corner of incremental and maybe gives us the ability to kind of take these the ideas and the, take these techniques of building incremental computations and apply them somewhat more generally. So that's one that's uh, one idea. And then another idea which is somewhat older, uh, and in fact comes from other research that has happened on on previous systems that are kind of similar. Like there's a system called Father Time, which is a part of uh, the kind of guys who work on Scheme and Racket. Uh, and in that system, they had an optimization which is potentially attractive uh, called lowering, I think is the term they gave for it, which it's almost a kind of inlining optimization. It's basically, so in, in Father Time, they, instead of saying, oh, you can, you can choose when to use this incremental abstraction, they just use it everywhere. Like kind of, it was baked into the fabric, fabric every time there's like an open paren, you know, in, in some scheme program, like there was another incremental there. And that's sort of a disaster because you have so many of them that you're really swamped by the overhead of the incremental computation. Uh, and so what they did was they basically used ways of choosing to kind of merge together nodes, trying to optimize by saying, ah, it's not really worth it to have these all broken down. We'll, we'll have bigger nodes that do bigger pieces uh, and less, less incrementalization, but overall better efficiency. And that's the thing you could imagine us doing as well. I think the promising direction is to do a kind of trace-based optimization where you keep some statistics about how long things take, and then you can use those statistics for making decisions about how to collapse nodes. So it's, it's, this is a much less important optimization for us because we already get to make explicit choices about where we do and don't want to construct these nodes. And so programmers have a lot of direct control over the performance. Uh, but it would still be nice. It would allow you to kind of throw in a lot of incrementality without thinking too hard about it and then have you know, some optimizer kind of come back and claw back decent performance for you. Anyway, that basically covers uh, the whole thing. Um, uh, I guess the, the, for me, I think the, the interesting there's a few interesting things to learn from this. One is, it's just interesting how far you might need to go from the thing you read in some paper to something you're really happy to use in production. Um, and it also, I think, highlights that there's lots of interesting 
ideas that you have to dig through to get to that really good implementation. Like it, it was one of these cases where we didn't just say, oh, make it better. We really sat down and did a lot of experimentation. And I think the end result of that experimentation is we really understood the problem well and were able to get to an implementation that really delivered useful things for the actual practical work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, I think, is that. Did anyone, any final questions? All right, thank you.